This video will be a little bit different than what I've done on the channel so far. As explained in my video on generalism, I have multiple interests and try to recombine them to create something new that is either insightful or inspiring. To me, desire is an interesting topic and it somehow really fits this time of the year. Whether that's Christmas presents that we desire, especially as kids, or New Year's resolutions that we set which are nothing else than our expressed desire to change in one way or another, or goals we desire to reach and therefore strive for. I'll cover what we desire, why we desire and if having desires is good or bad in terms of living a good life. From a perspective of Adlerian psychology, also known as individual psychology, stoicism and a little bit of Buddhism as well. A few books that I used as resources for this video are Man's Search for Meaning, The Courage to be Disliked, The Individual Psychology of Alfred Adler, Awareness, The Perils and Opportunities of Reality, Discourses, Human Action and The Shortness of Life. Let's start with goals, which are basically a representation or even synonym to our desires. We set goals to give meaning to our life. This was best captured by Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. In Nazi death camps, he observed that people who had self-proclaimed goals were the ones most likely to survive. He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Viktor Frankl was the founder of the psychiatric method of logotherapy, which literally means healing through meaning. Finding a meaning in our life and striving for it keeps us alive and is our primary motivational force. One desire that everyone has, according to Alfred Adler's School of Individual Psychology, is to feel significant. We strive from a position of inferiority to reach superiority. We shall always find in human beings this great line of activity. The struggle to rise from an inferior to a superior position. From defeat to victory, from below to above. It begins in earliest childhood and continues to the end of our lives. If you think about this outside of your own life, but in novels and movies for example, you realize that almost every story has this sort of arc. We can identify with the hero in these stories, because we are the same even if we are not always aware of it and it might be more subtle. Ludwig von Mises describes the striving in his masterpiece Human Action, a treatise on economics. Action means the employment of means for the attainment of ends. Acting man is eager to substitute a more satisfactory state of affairs for a less satisfactory. His mind imagines conditions which suit him better and his action aims at bringing about this desired state. This is why incentive design is incredibly important. This is what makes incentive design so difficult. As Charlie Munger says, if you can be working on incentives, don't work on anything else. Almost all human behavior can be explained by incentives. And the study of signaling and signals is seeing what people do despite what they say. People are much more honest with their actions than they are with their words. You have to get the incentives right to get people to behave correctly. It's a very, very difficult problem. Adler is saying that the pursuit of superiority and the feeling of inferiority are not diseases but stimulants to normal healthy striving and growth. If it is not used in the wrong way, the feeling of inferiority too can promote striving and growth. Superiority has a very hierarchical sound to it. For you to be superior, someone else needs to be inferior. But this is not how Adler sees it. You can reach superiority without competition. On the same level playing field, there are people who are moving forward and there are people who are moving forward behind them. The pursuit of superiority is the mindset of taking a single step forward on one's own feet, not the mindset of competition of the sort that necessitates aiming to be greater than other people. So it's a very personal and also individual striving which gives Adler School the name Individual Psychology. Different people give different meanings to what feeling significant or superior means. It's dependent on your worldview. You can only get feelings of inferiority or insignificance if you are unable to reach your self-proclaimed goals. For example, if being wealthy is not what you think is important in life, you won't feel inferior to someone who is wealthy. Because in your worldview, wealth plays no role in your striving for superiority. You can also draw a link to Buddhism here. One of the central Buddhist saying is desire is suffering. This aligns with what Adler says. You pick your goals or desires and suffer from them as long as you don't reach them because you feel inferior until that point. We don't want to be happy, we want other things. Or let's put it more accurately, we don't want to be unconditionally happy. I'm ready to be happy provided I have this and that and the other thing. But this is really to say to our friend or to God or to anyone, you are my happiness, if I don't get you, I refuse to be happy. So there's kind of two ways out of the trap. One is not wanting something is as good as having it. 
right? I think it was Liad Shabo said this on Twitter. I, I thought it was really good. Or there's a re- recent Socrates quote that I retweeted where he was taken to a, the story is he was taken to a, a market back in ancient Greece and it was full of luxurious and fine items. And he said, there are so many things that, that I do not want, <laughs> right? And it was, just <laughs> he looked at all these fineries and said, so many things here that I do not want. And I thought that is freedom. That is power. That is self-contained. Uh, that is a person who has found himself and needs nothing outside of himself. That is so inspirational. So the same way I look upon the world and I say, well, I could just say that, right? You can't just say that. If, if I just said, there are so many things that I don't want, it's not true. I want the money. I want the girl. You know, I want. The, I wanted the fame or I wouldn't have gone on podcasts and I wouldn't be on Twitter. At some level, that is true. So... Obviously, there are certain things that I want. I'm not a monk. I'm not a. I'm not living in an ashram. But what I can do is I've gotten the things that I want, and I'm careful not to want more. I don't want more fame. I don't want more money. Although if I get it, it's fine. It's part of the craft. It's part of the bonus. You know. So I have to be careful about what I about not unconsciously taking on new desires. If I'm taking on a new desire, I better go fulfill that. So these are all just games that I'm playing. And, you know, you got to play some game. You're on this planet. You're alive. You might as well play something. Now, the question is, what game do you play and how do you get out of the game so you're not just trapped playing that game forever? And one way is you choose your games very carefully. If you're a monk, you only choose very, very few games to play or you play no games and you live content, blissful, harmonious, peaceful. Or the other is you play the game and you win it and then you say, I am now free of this. So what that tweet is, that tweet is the reason to play the game, sorry, the reason to win the game is to be free of it. It's a reminder to myself that for the games that I've won, it's time to let go of them and to be free of them and not to unconsciously double down by comparing myself to the Joneses and continuing to level up and level up and level up and level up. And then one day you die and then you're like, okay, that was pointless. Like, you know, I, I did all that work for what? like for nothing. So if you're not enjoying it anymore, if you've already won the game by the definition you had when you started playing the game, and one hack is to set the definition early on so that when you go past it, you know you've won, to not get trapped into playing this game forever and just living in some anxious future as opposed to actually enjoying yourself in the present, you have to know when to stop playing the game. After you reach your desires, your suffering most likely won't end because the concept of hedonic adaptation takes place. You are always at any point in time on the hedonic treadmill. Once you achieve something, you will get used to it quickly and need to find another meaning or desire. The ancient Stoics had a very similar perception about desire. Marcus Aurelius put it succinctly and practical in his meditations. Very little is needed to make a happy life. Don't dream about things you don't have. Instead, think about the best things you now have and how much you would crave them if you didn't have them. At the same time, don't value them so much that you will be upset if you lose them. Seneca had a similar point of view. Assume that fortune carries you far beyond the limits of private income, decks you with gold, clothes you in purple. You will only learn from such things to crave still greater. And Epictetus wrote a lot about desire as well. People to whom such things are still denied come to imagine that everything good will be theirs if only they could acquire them. Then they get them, and their longing is unchanged, their anxiety is unchanged. Their disgust is no less, and they still long for whatever is lacking. Freedom is not achieved by satisfying desire, but by eliminating it. But I don't agree that never desiring anything or completely eliminating desire is the solution. As explained in the beginning of the video, desire is human. It's a goal setting that can give meaning to our lives. Looking outside yourself for anything is the fundamental delusion. Not to say you shouldn't do things on the outside. You absolutely should. You are meant to do something. You are not just meant to lie there in the sand and meditate all day long. You should self-actualize. So desire is not bad per se, but having too many of them will make you suffer from a feeling of inferiority in those areas of your life. Sure, strive towards some form of greatness, but don't make your happiness outcome dependent. Just enjoy the ride and be aware that your happiness won't change once you reached what you desired. I think we go about desiring things all day long and then wonder why we are unhappy. I like to stay aware of it because then I can choose my desires very carefully. And that's what I agree with. Eliminating desire is not necessary. An awareness of your desires and a realization that what you want is not what you need to live a good life is enough already. Keep that in mind and then go get or create whatever you want. To summarize with an outlook on 2021, I definitely will set goals for myself again. I do so on a yearly, quarterly and monthly basis. 
but I don't let myself feel miserable or inferior if I don't reach them. I don't let self-development mutate into self-punishment. The goals I fail to achieve often have the greatest learning in that I figure out how I need to change my approach to achieve them in the next month, quarter or year. It's all about remaining a beginner's mind and realizing that the journey is the reward. And as Adler's psychology shows, we are all moving forward, but each one of us at his or her own pace.